Good morning. Welcome to Now You Know. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, I don't have Katie here to introduce things. Katie is a bit under the weather this morning, but uh, she's pretty good at recuperating quickly, and I'm sure we'll have her back for the next show. So, so anyways, I have to do my own introductions here this morning, but I, I have somebody who I think is going to make for a very interesting program. Uh, Christy Mitchell, who is from the Maine Historic Preservation. Mm -hmm. And Christy should be a fountain of knowledge on this stuff because she <laughs> has been there for a long time, since uh, 2001. And uh, so about 17 years. Yeah. And you are the deputy director, is that the case? Um, I have two titles. I am okay. the assistant director of the commission. Okay. And the commission is also the State Historic Preservation Office, and as such I am the Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer. Ah, so That's two titles two there. Titles. Okay. <laughs> and the State Historic Preservation is is funded by the national government, is that correct? Well, mostly funded with some state funding. Yep, we are par partially funded. Um, the State Historic Preservation Office um, comes out of a federal um, act, the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966, as amended, I'll say, um, which established programs for each state to have, or established the possibility for each state to have a historic preservation program. Um, Maine's program was started in 1971 um, as the Maine Historic Preservation Commission, and we are a uh, independent commission within the executive branch of state government. So we receive state funding for some of our positions and we also receive a federal um, apportionment every year that supports a lot of our activities so but we are a state office how's that work year to year are you pretty sure of your funding from one year to the next or of course with all the issues going on with congress now i would think that might be well, Very it, a bit. It's, a, it's a appropriated to us by Congress. Um, the money for the State Historic Preservation Offices comes from an Alaskan offshore oil account that is dedicated to go into something called the Historic Preservation Fund. That fund is authorized uh, at a certain level every year by Congress and then um, split among the states, the territories, and the Tribal Historic Preservation Offices. Yeah. So. Yes, I, I, we never say guaranteed. We have to apply for it every year, um, and sometimes it is it comes a little bit later than we wish it would. Um, delays like continuing resolutions make it difficult to to balance everything. But but we're we're you know. you, you 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 pretty much know you're going to get. We it, we, yeah. we hope we are. Yeah, it hasn't been cut out entirely. It has been reduced over the years. Now, Alaskan <laughs> offshore. Fund. You were talking about that a little bit. Did this have anything to do with Exxon Valdez? No. No. It had nothing to I do with that. Believe, I don't believe it does. <laughs> yeah. It's actual, um, if I know right, it's uh, leasing, the money from leasing offshore oil bottoms. That leasing goes into the Historic Preservation Fund. Okay, and that that is the sole source then? I believe so. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. So there must be some pretty good leasing fees that they pay to, to do that, I, I would, would think. I would imagine so. I, I guess the idea was that um, a non-renewable resource, oil, mm -hmm. um, the cost of, of creating that, drilling for that, is being fed into something that we want to preserve. So there's kind of an offset. That makes there. sense. Yeah. That makes sense. Now, you're, you have um, 11 commissioners over seeing you, right? And you're your own agency. Mm -hmm. uh, and nine of them are appointed by the governor, yes. and then two are ex officio, or whatever the terminology. Ex officio, right. Uh, for that. How does that, uh, what types of terms do they have? Or I believe it's three year terms, and you can serve three at a time. Yeah. Um, I may be wrong, it may be five year terms. Um, we don't have a lot of turnover. People get on the commission and they enjoy being there. Um, our ex officio are um, members of um, the Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. They send a representative um, to us, and the Department of Transportation sends a representative. Okay. Um, but the commissioners themselves, um, we have members of the public, and then um, we're required to have archaeologists, architects, and architectural historians. Okay. These are the type of people who are familiar with the work we do, 
Um, so that's, you know, along those lines, we ha usually have a prehistoric archaeologist okay. and a historic archaeologist and then uh, architect. and um, So that they're very supportive of an understanding of how we run our So office. they try to have a balance of, of architects and archaeologists and, yeah. and so forth yeah. to make this thing. Is there anything particularly political about these appointments? Since the governor appoints nine of them, uh, is there... Is there any Republican friends that he appoints, or is it? Uh, I, I don't. I don't think I've, I've never gotten a sense that that came into play. I mean, historic preservation isn't a overtly political. You're probably one of the few departments that isn't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, which is, which is kind of interesting. I, I don't see the politics in that really, anyways. But I but I I was just asking. Yeah. No. That. Not that's not really an issue for us. Yeah. Now you have a staff um, that what I read ranges from. 10 to 16 or something, something like and that. it's and it has architects and archaeologists and yep. and uh, we others, have, I guess. Yeah, we have full-time year-round staff. Um, we have a historic archaeologist, um, Arthur Spies. He's our, our senior historic archaeologist. He's been with us for almost 40 years. Yeah. Um, we have a historic archaeologist. Um, we also have three architectural historians. Um, I am by training an architectural historian, so if you count me, that's a fourth. Okay. Um, the director. Okay. Um, a support person, um, administrative support. And then we have um, two to three year round um, technicians who work in the field or in the laboratory, um, and, and by technicians, that's that's their title, archaeology technician, but these are really kind of archaeologists his, and historians who bring an incredible um, diversity of skills and understanding to the office. And then in the summer, we, we'll hire two or three, four people, depending on the types of work that has to be done in the field. So you're trying to identify, or I think you use the term survey in here, mm -hmm. survey different properties to determine whether or not they merit being on uh, the National Historic Register or, you know, that's... We do. Uh, and um, how do you go about that? A number of different ways. Um, it's a lot of uh, boots on the ground really, yeah, yeah. Um, these days still, although technology is starting to change that. Um, as part of the, the mission of our office really is to uphold the National Historic Preservation Act laws. And um, part of that is we need to identify, evaluate, and then protect or preserve or plan for the protection and preservation of historic property. So at the basis of that is identification. Um, we do this in, um, really through a house by house, building by building, inventory, boots on the ground, taking the pictures, putting them on maps. And this has started since 1972 and we have hundreds, uh, probably 120,000 properties that we've recorded over that time yeah. um, throughout Maine. Now some of those were done in the 70s and some mm -hmm. of them were done last week. Um, okay. But we, we currently <laughs> have ongoing surveys um, in the town of Monson and also in Millinocket are the two places where we're actively surveying There's right a lot now. going on in Monson right now there because, is a lot. Um, what's the name of that organization? Is it the Lieberman? Libra? Libra. Libra. I'm sorry. Yep. Lieberman was the senator. Libra or, Libra, Libra. or uh, August? Yeah. It might be the August. Yeah, and they have. I understand, bought up a, a number of properties up there too, but does that have anything to do with the National Historic, or is it, or are they trying to do things that? No, they have a they have a plan for you know reinvigorating the town. Yeah, I'm not really privy to that, but we once we became aware of that, we wanted to use um, this opportunity to capture a snapshot yeah. of what the town was before it changes. Oh, okay. So it's really a matter of. Um, this is not. This is really to, to to gather the information so that we have it for the historic record, so that um, we can preserve a little bit of their history through photographs and research. Um, but could they come to you and say, "Look, we want to rehab and change these buildings, but we'd like to do it in an historic way"? Or could there be communication? 
Oh yeah, yeah. 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 Um, you know, one of the reasons we use survey is to uh, to see if there are properties that merit um, listing in the National Register of Historic Places, either individually or as a historic district or a group of buildings. Um, if there were properties up there that they wanted us to evaluate, um, we could do that, and then we could work with them to, you know, um, maintain the character, defining features, the historic integrity of the buildings, or we could work with them using tax credits to do various things. There's a lot of opportunity, and that's a lot of what we do is consultation and communication with people. But by the fact that we're doing survey up there, we're just collecting information. This has nothing to do with what they're doing or what they want to do. It's just kind of a, a parallel um, effort at this point. So you, and you say a lot about, uh, you mentioned several times about boots on the ground. Now, boots on the ground, does that entail just sending people out on field trips looking for things, or, or, or do you have contacts in communities and areas of the state that say, hey, you should come up here and look at this. Uh, we really want to preserve this property. Does yeah. it have a value yeah. to a National Historic? So we um, have, I guess, three, um, three main ways that we get information on historic properties. The first is you suggest our property owners who say, yeah, I've got this great house or this great barn or um, this store, and you know, I, I'd like to know more about it. Is it, is it eligible for historic register? So that's one, one way. Or, or town managers, um, people who want to take an inventory of their town for whatever, planning, master planning, community comprehensive survey. So people come to us, that's one way. Um, the other is that our office identifies um, communities that we think um, need to be surveyed, where we'd like to get information. Um, we had never done Millinocket. Um, we haven't done a comprehensive survey of Madison. Okay. Um, or You're here today. We are. To get it started. <laughs> oh, we haven't done Fairfield, Anson, Dover, Foxcroft, Sangerville. We have little pieces of information from here and there. So we might target a community and say, right now we want to we want to put some investment in that. And we hire, um, if unless our staff can do it, which seldom can we actually go out and do it. We hire specialists, um, cultural resource managers, architectural historians who specialize in this, and they go through a, a whole process. Um, that's set up with our office. Um, so do you have people who are actually staff and then others that you hire year to year to assist Just on with contract. You? On just, contract yeah, basis. First, yeah, first, a project contract basis. Okay. And then the third way that we get um, uh, much of our information, in fact, a, a real uh, bulk of our information over time, is through um, a program um, that is commonly referred to as Section 106. It's a review and compliance type program. And this is a large part of what our office does. Um, and it, so I, I can get more into that in a, in a minute, but um, there's a lot of projects that require architectural survey as part of the projects. The Department of Transportation is constantly undertaking projects on roads that could impact historic properties. So they have um, contractors that they hire to go out and do survey activities that then comes into our office for evaluation. And same with some private developers. There so. are cases where um Let's say you have some, perhaps some historic properties that are located on major roads and the, and the state says, you know, we really want to expand this road, make it four lanes or, you know, whatever. Is there a consultation with you that says, look, there's, there's potential historic properties here that exactly we may right. have to move or alter or, or do something to it? Exactly right. That's part of the Section 106 um, process. If there's a federal component to their activities, yeah. so that would be federal licensing or federal permitting, um, or uh, federal funding, which is the big thing. Then there is a, a there is a formal process that they have to consult with us to see one to identify any historic properties, and then to determine if there's any effects or adverse effects on those. And if there are, we go through negotiations. And if you know there's a process for uh, minimizing or avoiding uh, adverse effects when possible. Um, and when not possible, uh, we, we work on a mitigation strategy with them. So it's, an on, it's, a, it's quite a bit of what our office does, actually, is reviewing projects, everything from Federal Aviation Commission to um, HUD projects um, to uh, DOT, um, anything that has a federal component um, and can affect a historic property, um, it com usually comes through our office for consultation. Well. Uh, uh, one um, 
I guess structure in this area that I think was involved in that was the um, bridge yes. in Norridgewalk. And of course that was the arched bridge um, that uh, was in pretty poor shape and yeah. needed to be replaced. And, and uh, I think, so you folks were very involved with how the design of that was to be. Was that your architectural engineers involved in that? No, we don't, we don't actually get involved in the design. Um, now, I wasn't directly um, involved with the process, but my understanding is that, yes, yeah, so that was a bridge that um, it had been designed by Llewellyn, Llewellyn Edwards, who was a, bridge, a very well-known bridge engineer with the Department of Transportation. And that particular arch design, um, there were only a few in Maine. That was one of the yeah. last. And it was very distinctive. Mm. Um, we recognized it as a historic property, and there was a consultation process. Um, my understanding is that there was a lot of public sentiment about trying to put something back in that had well, had maybe not the arch, but had some sort of reference to the yeah. historic bridge. DOT actually came up with the design as one of their many alternatives for that bridge, and it turned out to be one, as they priced it out, to be um, an economical design for them. If it hadn't been... Um, affordable. If it hadn't been in the ballpark along with other designs, we wouldn't have been able to make them choose it. It is what they actually did. We consulted, but we don't have a, the power to say yay or nay. Okay. But they, if it's a federal project, they at least have to consult, right? They have to right? consult. Yeah. Okay. And, and it turned out to be an absolutely beautiful bridge. And I, I think um, pretty well perceived. Yeah. Uh, in the public, and one thing that they did do, even though you got the arches, they're big, wide arches, and it was set up a lot better than and wider than the original mm -hmm. bridge, so that the visibility was a whole lot better. There was a real visibility yeah. issue with the other, and some major accidents at, yeah. at uh, the intersection of the of the river road and 201A. Mm -hmm. So, and I haven't heard of any major issues since well, that that's time, good. which is. Well, which I know is that I know good. that because of the design of the bridge, they didn't have to. Um, I think they didn't have to make as many changes to the abutments as they would have with some of the other changes, uh, some of the other bridge designs. So that was one of the things that, that led them to choose this yeah. design. Um, I also know that as part of this mitigation for this project, the loss of the original bridges, that the DOT put out a small booklet about bridges and roads in the Skowhegan area. So oh, interesting. It, yeah. That should be available through DOT, if, yeah. <laughs> if not at your local bookstore. Oh, very, very good. <laughs> So, um, you folks have, I think it's like, cer is it certified communities or, or community, you have like 10 communities that um, have met your criteria for National Historic These are Funding, and I'm probably not saying this right, but, uh, but there are like 10 communities in the state that are certified communities, is That's that right. correct? That's right. So this is a program of the National Park Service. The National Park Service oversees our, you know, it's, it's the National Park Service is our federal component. And because they realized that, you know, there's a state office, but really communities, um, it's preservation planning, um, preservation really exists at the community level. Um, we are here to help throughout the state, but it's up to the people of any neighborhood or community to determine what's important to them and how to best manage their resources. And so the program called the Certified Local Government Program, Certified Local Government. right, that has been around, um, well, for, for several decades. I'm not quite sure when it started, probably in the early 80s. And what it means is that if a, if a community takes a number of steps, including um, passing a historic preservation ordinance, um, developing a historic preservation review board or commission of some sort. Um, and then undertaking survey, architectural survey, so that they know what's in their community. Um, they are given um, the opportunity to take on some of the responsibilities that are usually handed by our office. Mm. Exactly. For example, they could identify a property and say, we'd like to see this nominated for the National Register and hire somebody to do it and usher it through the process where, and then communicate with us about it. Usually we handle that whole process. A community could do that. One of the benefits of it is money. 
Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get to the it money. It always Follow comes down to money. money, doesn't it? Yeah. So, right. so we are required um, to uh, put 10% of our federal apportionment every year aside just for grants to these 10 communities. Um, and the, they're passed through grants. They can either be applied for by the municipality itself to work on one of their historic properties, or they can be applied for on behalf of a nonprofit organization um, to work on one of their properties. So, um, for example, um, we've given grants to, let's see, we haven't given any, there's no certified local governments in Somerset or Piscataquis County. Um, there's one in Penobscot, that's Bangor, um, Lewiston, um, Saco, um, Portland, Gardner, Augusta's working on becoming one. Um, is it very? Is it pretty involved to do it? Well, I, if it is, a little if bit. only ten are on it, I, I'm out of. I don't know how many communities in there, right. and I would just I would assume that probably you need an active planning board or um, or a uh, so active. We have a couple smaller communities. Castine yeah. um, is a pretty you know pretty small community. Yeah. Um, York um, is a relatively small community, and they both are in this. So, it, it it's not do, it's not a top heavy program. Um, what I think is is um, hard is is there's a lot of places that don't really. Um, want to pass a lot of ordinances and, and people may be hesitant um, to to pass an ordinance um, involving historic properties in their town um, but it's a com it's a local effort that should reflect what the local people want so but um, but anyhow we do give grants um, I was just trying to think of the most common ones we're giving a grant in Lewiston right now to nominate a uh, commercial historic district downtown to the National Register. We're giving money to the Friends of Fort, um, uh, Friends of Fort Gorgeous last year in Casco Bay through the city of Portland to fix up that fort. Um, so there's a whole range of, of things that can be done. And every year we have to give this money away. So of the 10 communities, um, there's there's money waiting there for. But the only way you can get a grant is to be one of the cer certified through, local through that pot of yeah. money. There's yeah. there's another pot of money that we another two t pots of money that we can tap into. Okay, and you do things like with tax credits and we so do. forth. How does that work? The federal government um, created a rehabilitation tax credit program uh, at the end of the seventies, I believe. And the state of Maine created one in the 90s and then revamped it in about 2009. And what that is, is um, it's a tax credit for the certified rehabilitation costs for a certified historic building. Yeah. So there's some basic things here. First of all, it's for buildings that are um, depreciable. They have to be commercial or somehow depreciable. So there's been some, you know, bed and breakfast been in there. Um, they have to be listed in the National Register. Yeah. And then um, what it is is that they work very closely with our office um, to develop their plans and then document their plans. Their plans get reviewed by the National Park Service. They get reviewed by our office. Um, if they stick to their plans and execute the, the uh, construction, um, the rehabilitation, according to plan, then they are eligible for tax credits, and it's 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 a nice program. There's the federal tax credit is twenty percent of your qualified costs, so that's twenty five uh, twenty percent of of what you put into it. That that's pretty meet, significant. That's pretty significant. That meets, um, you know, not all costs qualify. You can't do um, new construction. You can't site work, um, landscaping. That doesn't meet. Um, meet the, the test, but you know anything bricks and mortar you do the building that is rehabilitation that follows the Secretary of the Interior Standards, 20% tax credit on that. Um, but then the state tax credit is 25%, so when you bundle those together you have 45% tax credit. Yeah. Um, and then there's an additional 5% tax credit for um, affordable housing. So, you know, some of the programs um, some people are able to get close to 50% tax credit. 
tax credits on their projects. And um, you know, we since the rehab credit has been revised in 2009, um, we've done about 72 projects um, throughout the state. Um, there's two in um, in this area, the Gerald Hotel in Fairfield. Oh yes, yes, yeah. yeah. And uh, the Gerald, um, it was beautiful hotel, architect designed, um, had been a, a furniture store. I guess, that's right. That. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And um, that has gone through the tax credit program. Now it's senior housing. Mm -hmm. um, and there was something like five million nine hundred thousand dollars worth of qualified expenses on that. And uh, so, so there's. Wow a substantial tax credit that is being um, used over time. But uh, since 2009, we've had um, about $58 million in tax credits um, that ha have been given out through this program. And that's on a little over $500 million worth of investment in the state. Oh, that's substantial. It is substantial. And you wonder how much of that would have happened without those tax credits. Well, if you think that, you know, a lot of this happened during the recession. This was one of the only places that the economy, the con construction economy, was moving forwards was through rehabilitation programs. So, and it's good. It brings a lot of jobs, permanent jobs, to the area. Almost thirty-five hundred jobs have been created through these programs. Um, so, and a lot of places that, um, like the Gerald, um, or like up in Dover Foxcroft, the American Woolen Mill, you know. They're big, big complexes that used to contribute to the tax rolls of a town, and when they're, when businesses are gone, you know it really decreases the tax revenue. But rehabilitating these buildings, putting them back into the tax rolls, really, you know, gives back to the local community not just the jobs, but by having you know, ongoing employment and taxes and so on. Yeah. So it's it's a it's a great program. And for Fairfield, I mean having the senior housing and having those folks right in the middle of the downtown section. Right. You know, you've got a lot of uh consumers who are right there that could help the local businesses downtown. And and even during the the rehabilitation construction process, you have people right, right. going out to lunch and you know, you know, stopping and buying their coffee every day. And I mean, it, it, the nickels and dimes add up. But it's it's a really it's a really fantastic program and um we're pretty thrilled. To, one of my colleagues, Mike Johnson, is in, in charge of that. Um, he's been doing this a long time and is just a wealth of information um, and has really, really is a great advocate for this program. Do you have many communities, uh, you know, you only have 10 certified local government mm -hmm. that pick up the phone and call you folks every once in a while and say, you know, we're thinking of, uh, you know, having a rehab project or something in our local community. Yeah. and like to see if it fits on the National Historic Register and get funding and uh, all the time. Okay. All the time. We talk to we talk to private property owners. We talk to nonprofit people. We talk to community groups. Talk to municipal officers. Um, there is a large part of what we do is is uh, technical assistance. Um, whether there there is an official consultation process or not, um, we're constantly helping people to. Um, plan, identify, you know, identify the historic properties, and then plan for what to do with them. That's that's really the the, the role of our office. So some of these communities have got you on speed dial to call if they have to, <laughs> right? So, well, certainly, like, you know, there's quite a few communities out there that um, we help with, um, you know, as they go through the process of maybe creating a historic um, preservation ordinance in their town. They'll come and, and consult with us. We'll share what other towns have done. We'll work with them to identify, you know, things that could help their community make decisions. Um, we have four communities right now who are on the edge of becoming certified local governments. They're going through the process. But there's many, many communities in, in the state um, that have historic preservation commissions or historic district ordinances. Um, Durham, South Berwick, Phippsburg. I mean, just little Damariscotta is passing one. Little communities all over the place. Um, I really care. People, you know, people care about their built environment here because that's what makes us made, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's our hist It's those buildings that give us a sense of place. In every town, there's that one spot. Every town, there's one spot that says, 
this is what Green Maine is about. This is this is what Monson is about. You know, a lot of it's tap community pride. You know, yeah, absolutely. Having a, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and it's hard. It's very hard to to move forwards with, you know, um, caring for old properties as well as moving forwards with jobs and economy and caring for, you know, people. So yeah. Now you you do something with easements too. You want to explain how that works? Um, we we give as I, we talked before about um, our certified local government grants. Right. Um, we also have grants through um, a historic preservation fund grants that we make um, available to nonprofit organizations and municipalities um, who own again National Register listed properties. Um, and then there's a, a small state funded grant program, the New Century. Uh, community fund that occasionally we're able to give out um, small grants for. Because um, the way these work is that in exchange for money to undertake bricks and mortar activities on your property, um, the property owner will give us a term easement or a term covenant. Um, okay. So at up to, I think it's up to $10,000 in, in grant aid, they agreed for five years to maintain the property, to allow public access if, it's, if, if that's appropriate, and to check with us about, um, well they have to check with us before making any changes to the building. Um, after $10,000 I think it's a 10 year easement. Um, so those, they go away. Unless they get another grant, we do have some. So it's your way of maintaining some control some for control. a period of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah some control. Um, you know, because it's a public investment in property, we want to make sure that the investment is longer lasting, as long lasting as possible. Okay. Yeah. Now you now when I think of historic preservation, I'm thinking of, of structures, but you're preserving more than just. Buildings, is that correct? Buildings, um, sites, yeah. archaeological sites. Um, we do a lot of work with archaeology. Um, we we do structures, which we define as non-habitation, so um, bridges, for example, um, dams, those kind of things. We also do parks, um, recreation areas. Um, there's a there's a vast variety of things. Industrial sites. Hmm. Industrial things. Um, I wouldn't think of that. Boats, it's a, but it's part of history. Yeah, I mean it can be. We do vessels. Okay. We, yeah, we have. There's a number of uh, schooners um, up in Greenville, actually, the Lake Boat Katahdin. Oh yes, yes. It's listed in the but National Register. You know, those are things I wouldn't think of. Uh, right. I'm just thinking mostly of buildings, and I'm sure a lot of people are the think the same way I do. Absolutely, because you think National Register of Historic Places, so you think yes. of something that's going to be in one place all the time. Yeah. But um, in fact, it's uh, we do um, railroad um, engines and, and cars. Um, we do rail lines. Yeah. Um, uh, trolleys. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't done any planes. I don't know about that. Okay. I don't know what I don't know how playing. But plays that's far more wide-reaching than I would think. Oh, absolutely. Abso yeah. yeah. No. It's it's again. It's it's the places that give us a sense of who we are, and and everything we we work with we work with because it has a story to tell. There's something about that building or the train or the dam that helps us understand where we came from and why choices were made over time, yeah. and how we expressed ourselves. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Now you folks have, what, five-year plans of, of... We do. Yeah, looking at this. This is not like the Soviet five-year plans, where they <laughs> uh, they have these agricultural goals that they never met. Um, <laughs> I'm assuming you accomplish a great deal in your five-year plans, but what, what happens in those five-year plans? Well, again, this is something that um, to hold our office uh, in part accountable for making sure that we're thinking ahead. Um, we are required to put together a, a, a statewide plan every five years. Now, a lot of people think it might be, you know, what our office is going to do for the next five years, but it's not. It's a plan that develops when communication with preservation partners, municipalities, state agencies, nonprofit organizations, uh, across the state to identify what are the pressing needs for preservation and um, how can we work together to move forwards with them. Okay. So we send out surveys. 
Um, our office puts the plan together, but we work with a lot of people to, to vet it and review it. Um, and then we, we come up with goals. Um, a perennial goal is usually around education. Um, this year, a couple of the specific things um, were that we were hoping to work with, uh, hoping to be able to um, encourage some trades and technical education around timber framing, restoration, that kind of thing. And um, just so happens, Kennebec Valley Community College um, located down at Hinkley, mm -hmm. um, has started a sustainable carpentry program okay. that is around that does teaches timber framing skills and has a restoration bent to it, a, a, a track you can take. So I sit on their advisory board. So oh, it's one of the ways that you know uh, we we were able to actually kind of um, help to to promote one of our goals is to to encourage them and work with them. So education is one of our goals. Okay. Um, we do a lot with um, uh, trying to promote um, municipal municipalities um, uh, to undertake planning, comprehensive planning that involves historic properties. To think about them, um, we're talking about trying to do some training with. Uh, maybe the main municipal association in the next couple of years for real estate agents and code enforcement officers. Mm -hmm. um, and just now we've just uh, awarded a grant to an historic architect who's going to put together a training video for historic preservation commissions throughout the state for the application of um, historic building codes on historic buildings because that's a whole specialty. So, mm. so that's, those are some of our, 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 our plans. Um, in the state plan. Um, another area, if I can just go on a right, little longer, right ahead. Yeah, right ahead. <laughs> um, is um, we're, we're talking about, uh, we've uh, acknowledged that uh, we need to um, identify properties that m may be impacted by changing climate. And so that's one of the things that we're focusing on in the, in the next uh, few years, um, is trying to get some um, strategies out there for municipalities or organizations to use to, to help identify what the risks are to historic buildings, if any, from any sort of climate change, drought, windstorms, winter storms, storm surge, flooding. Well, I, I was just going to say, you're, uh, I'm assuming, you know, you have a number of historic buildings that are in Abs flood zones on the coast Absolutely. and rising waters yeah. gradually, so some of those may in a number of years be impacted well by some that. some you know some have been impacted al already um, regardless of climate change if you look at the the Hollowell Gardner corridor a little further south yeah, from yeah. here um, I, their historic districts are entirely in the in the hundred oh. year flood flood oh. plain. big problem down there big problem down there every year almost yeah so right now we're, we've been working with Gardner as certified local government um, in helping to fund, um, they call it um, elevation certificates for their buildings that are in the historic floodplain, so that they can kind of move forwards with their planning. So it's a way that, that we can, you know, try and try and take some steps towards um, that that kind of thing. Interesting. Yeah. Well, you have uh, you folks out there may have noticed a little uh, computer screen next to me with a picture of a house and. Christy has uh, some slides on various um, properties that uh, Maine Historic has been involved in in both Somerset and Piscataquis counties. And so this might be a good time to show some of those slides and identify you know, where they are and uh, how you've been involved and what you've done with the, pro yeah. with the properties. Sure. So, so just to start off, the National Register of Historic Places, this is a, a program area that I've been involved with um, for quite a long time, is actually the nation's list of properties that merit preservation. Okay. Okay? It, it, it's very important to note that it doesn't require people to preserve their properties. It doesn't require them to maintain them. And it doesn't require them to um, uh, improve them or let people into them or anything like that. It's a way of helping people understand what's special and significant about a property, 
and helping them learn maybe why they might put effort into it. Mm. Okay, so that's something to get out there right away. We don't come in and say, don't paint your house pink. That's not us. <laughs> Although I would do that. You, you're welcome to. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I have just brought some of the, the properties that um, I've been familiar with over the years here. The first one is, um, this is the Burgess House in Sebec. Uh, it was built in 1816. Um, the oldest part of it is a cape, and it was probably built by Ichabod Young. Um, and he also built the first fulling mill in, in Piscataquis County. I was going to say, there's an historic name right there. Ichabod. Yeah. <laughs> Makes you think. Ichabod Crane, yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, the house was added on to in the 1830s and 1850s, but it's a remarkably early building for a region that was first settled about 1820. And one of the great things about this, and I'm terribly sorry that this isn't color, um, is that on the interior of the house there's really well-preserved fresco and stencil work by itinerant um, artists. Uh, Rufus Porter um, did the murals and Mo um, Moses Eaton did the stencils. And the walls are just, it's just vibrant with color. Um, so these were done probably again in the 1830s or so. Um, and there's a number of houses around the state that have these. Little wow. Sebec, Maine, quite an outpost for a it visiting itinerant artist to stop and paint his wares, but it's, it's, they're really beautiful. Our station manager, John, uh, can appreciate this. He's an artist uh, himself, and he, uh, he's with the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture every summertime. So, uh, John, if you want to ask any questions, you can <laughs> go right ahead. Because we don't have Katie today. Right. You, you're welcome to. Go right ahead. The next property is uh, the Weston House um, in um, Madison, the Weston Homestead, yes, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, beautiful federal period house. This is, uh, some people call this the New England large style. It's, it's got two chimneys and two stories front and back. Uh, gorgeous fan light over the door. Um, and again, another early settlers family, um, built about 1816, 1817. Weston is a, is a big name. Big name up here. There's big a dam name. by that name. <laughs> dam, yeah. dam Weston. Dam. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so I really, right now I'm just showing you a few of the, the, the really great properties right in the area. Um, this is the C.F. Douglas House, which is in Norwich Walk, built in 1868. And C.F. Douglas was an architect. Um, from Skowhegan, um, okay. uh, fairly well known, but I believe he had a fairly short uh, career. Um, he designed the Barker Mill in Auburn. That's his, the other thing he's really well known for. Um, this is the considered to be the finest Italian villa style house hmm. in, yeah. in in interior inland Maine. It's got the bell tower and a portico, which is this um, section here. Um, it's Italianate um, brackets under the roof um, it's eaves. It's really, yeah. it's really beautiful, beautiful home. A little bit later um, in the 19th century, we have the um, William E. Shaw House. This is Greenville, built in 1890. Um, most people recognize this right off as a, a Queen Anne style house. It's very vibrant. You know, when you think back. A couple of slides to the Weston House, which was white and square. Um, this is very colorful with a lot of undulating wall surfaces and dormers and balconies and and uh, all sorts of bay windows. Beautiful. So Shaw was a big name in Greenville. They um, uh, owned, um, I believe, a lumber company, and. Um, this was designed by a, a Gardner, Maine architect named E.E. E. Lewis, but then altered by a Bangor um, architect named Manser, um, Wilford Manser. And um, yeah, the M.G. Shaw Lumber Company uh, made really significant contributions to the economic and civic development of the Greenville area. So this was a, it's a beautiful house, but it's also recognizing the person behind it who um, had a lot of importance uh, in terms of developing the town. Do you have the, the location within the community for some of these houses? All of that information is available through our office. Okay. Yep. Um, unless, unless the, only, the only places that we don't make available are um, archaeological sites. Okay. But um, the National Register nominations are available through our office along with maps. But 
I, we have to say that these are these are a lot of them are privately owned. Okay. They are not. They don't want tons of visitors. Well, they're not right? open to the public. A lot of them are private. Yeah. Everyone that you've seen so far is a private home. Um, so we that's so, something we ask people to be respectful those, of. Those grounds are, are beautiful. They are, and this is an inn now, the Greenville Inn. So this one you can go. Oh, you can there. stay there. You can stay I, there. I was going to say it looks like a huge <laughs> place. You know, I I always try to speculate on what it would cost to build something like that yeah. today, and it'd be in the millions for sure. I would think. I would I would think so. Um, I would think so, but you know, when you own a lumber company, mm. it's a whole lot more economical to yeah, do so. <laughs> I <would> think so. <laughs> so, um, this is a this is a, a little historic district in Anson that they call the Temple's Historic District, and the fun thing about this is that there's three, and I'll point to them here: one, two, three little temple front houses that were built um, I think in the 1840s we call them temple front because they have the porticos yeah. with the columns on them yeah. and they look a little bit like Greek temples and that was something that was very popular starting in the um, 1820s and through the 1840s during a period of Greek um, uh, they were had a, uh, a revolution and there was a lot of ideas about Grecian democracy coming into America. And mm. so you find these little temple front houses all over the place. Mm. The Governor Coburn house here <laughs> also in Skowhegan is a, is a temple front house. So this is a little historic district, just of a couple of sweet little houses. Uh-huh. So one of the, we put on individual properties, but sometimes it's, it's groupings of properties that really convey yeah. history together. Um, so Historic districts often include commercial historic districts. And that picture was taken a few years ago. It was. Yeah. <laughs> it was. Yeah. You will see some older cars in these. Oh, As yeah. I said, we've been doing this for a long time. Some of these things actually come off of slides, not that was digital still media. Trust at that yeah. time, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. This is this is actually from when we designated it as a yeah. historic district. Um, Thirty-seven buildings built between about 1880 and 1910. Um, and they have all the different types of historic architecture that were popular during that time. Um, and so you get to see, you know, when the communities thrived, what it was that people were putting up and proud of. Um, Very interesting architecture in downtown Skowhegan, mm -hmm. and a lot of it, that it is an historic district, right? The yes. Town? Oh, yeah. yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, ripe for, for tax credit projects, if anybody's interested. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what would somebody have to go through to, for instance, that the owner of the old depositors trust what what's that process like for for the tax credits yeah well the, it's a three part process the first part is to make sure that your historic structure so that you're uh, listed in the historic register that's the first part mm -hmm. the second part is that you come to us with plans um, of what you want to do and we review those um, to see if they're in accordance with something called the secretary of the interiors standards for the rehabilitation of historic properties and this lays out some cans and can nots do's and don'ts may's and may nots that are are there to protect the 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 essential historic qualities of the building okay you can you can change the building you can remake it into what you need it to be but the essential historic qualities we want to stay there so that gets uh, reviewed those plans get reviewed by our office um, and then sent to the Washington DC where the National Park Service reviews them they'll come back and say this looks great or this looks great but make a modification here you do your project and then you document that you did it according to specifications we review that the National Park Service reviews that and then you're eligible for your tax credits. What type of time frame would be involved in, in this? It really depends on the size of your project. Right. You know we have some we have a small credit for projects that um, maybe just say a, 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 a facade or, or a storefront uh, rehab um, and they've been doing that in, in Lewiston and those you know those go much faster because you're dealing with um, one building and maybe one side of one building and maybe exterior only um, you know so you know it can move pretty quick but when you're dealing with a complex and multiple partners and multiple things over the years, it can be a very long process. Well, Skowhegan has been doing a facade, uh, downtown facade uh, uh, projects over the over the years right. and applies every 
almost every year really i'm on the I'm on the committee, and we, we've actually got it most years. That we, we didn't last year. There were a number of uh, participants, but we've applied again this year. And uh, National Historic ha has to sign off. We do. It's uh, come on this. Community Development Block Grants. Is yeah, that's exactly right. It's through the right. CDBG. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so that's part of that, um, that relationship I was talking to about earlier, is that this Community Development Block Grants are federal funding. So it's a federal undertaking. They consult with us. This, and if something's listed in the register, then we follow a set of guidelines on how the federal money can be used to do that. Yeah, we used to do it just strictly for the downtown, and now we've expanded it for the whole town. Mm -hmm. But uh, but basically, because the downtown was a historic district, I mean, we always had to go right, through, through you guys. Our, and, our and now that it's expanded to the town, I guess it's a case by case analysis. Right, on, exactly. On uh, whether that's exactly. the case. But yeah, that was a few years ago. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I must say the building looked a little better then. Um, this is an interesting property. Uh, this is up in Monson. It's the community church. And this is actually two churches that were moved and put together. One, well, oh. this is a congregational church on the left uh, from 1860. And this is a Baptist church um, from about 1845. And as the congregation shrunk, they decided to join forces. They moved this church on the right from down the road, attached it to this one, and then they made the bigger one on the left here into education and community space. Okay. So it shows kind of how communities adapt and evolve as okay. population shifts happen. Sure. Um, another another local church, Union Church in Mercer. Mercer. Yeah. yeah, this is a quintessential uh, main um, small community church, union church, multiple denominations. Architecturally, there's many of them like this throughout the state. And this is a really good example of this particular type of federal Gothic revival architecture. Another one, and you can see some of the similarities. Let's see if I go back here. Yeah, some mm, of the similarities, yes. the towers and the pinnacles on the top and the orientation and so on. S and so here we have the South Solon meeting okay. house, oh, yes, right? Yes. 1842. So again, really beautiful um, building for its architecture. The interior has is virtually unchanged, except, of course, for the incredible painting by the Skowhegan School of uh, Sculpture and Design. Mm. Um, that came in there and did true frescoes, um, starting between 1952 and 57. Um, juried selection of artists to come in and do that, um, and some nationally known artists: uh, William King, uh, Henry Varnum Poor, um, uh, Edward Brooks. Um, yeah. and this is just this is I have to say the gem, one of the hidden gems in Maine, one of the most beautiful places I've seen. I think they have fundraising events for that periodically, and and. Uh and I think they do have weddings there every once in yeah, a while. Yeah. Um, so we, it's still being used. Oh yeah, we've we've supported them with grants to help with their recent restoration. Yeah. Um, they had some structural problems. Uh, another church, um, this Baptist church in Skowhegan and yeah. the Bloomfield Academy. Yeah, yeah. Again, we've got religious architecture that's that's beautiful. We have education in the early chartered. I guess it was the Canaan Academy originally. Um, and then even smaller schoolhouses, one-room schoolhouses. This one's in Willimantic, mm -hmm. the Norton Corner Schoolhouse, one of two schoolhouses in the town. 150 people in that town, and this schoolhouse was used until 1965. Mm -hmm. One room. We've done a lot with historic barns um, because Maine's an agricultural state, and um, they're very important to us. This one also in Willimantic, Hathaway Barn. Uh, is based on some plans that came out of Orono at their college. Um, they were doing progressive barn architecture and spreading them around the state, and this is a, one of the barns that was based on that. This is a little barn in uh, Smithfield, um, which is uh, really a barn that you, you kind of have to get inside and look at the framing of it to see how important it is, but yeah. it, it shows how an early 19th century barn got but got rehabbed and remodeled into a 20th century dairy barn. Okay. Um, 
Oh, that's interesting. Isn't this a gem? This is the Henry Hudson Law Office in, in Guilford. Um, this is one of quite a few little tiny professional offices, often law offices around the state, that often were really uh, architecturally significant, that, that had a lot of... Um, what is that? That, that, that is it's a, unique. This is a mansard roof. Yeah. Um, it's uh, some people call it um, Second Empire. It's from the 1860s, 70s, um, yeah. and you have the mans mansard roof. It's actually a gate. Uh, there's a another layer to the roof up here. Yeah. It's kind of a a, 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 a gambrel or two pitch roof. Um, but it, it this style originated in France, and uh, became very you see them all over Maine. Popular for a short while. Uh, Sangerville Town Hall, we, we have a lot of buildings that we put in the register for their association with government and community. Um, libraries um, throughout the state, this Milo Library from 1922, it's uh, one of 18 Carnegie Libraries in the state of Ma Maine, um, funded by the um, Andrew Carnegie Foundation. Um, so also um, just, you know, a, a very important ed locally educated educationally important place locally. Um, the Norwich Walk Library, yeah. like the Hudson House that we just saw, this also was, a, was a, a lawyer's house, a lawyer's office initially. And Norwich Walk, of course, was the county seat. On this side of the river were some county buildings, uh, courthouses, and this is where a lawyer spent his time practicing his craft um, mm -hmm. and then became the library later. Just want to show a couple more quickly. This is also one of my favorites, the Slate House in Brownville. Chris, any guess what, what the walls are covered with? Slate. Any guess what the roof is covered with? Slate. <laughs> How about the doorsteps? Right, yeah, same thing. <laughs> yeah, it's the um, only building in the, in the state that has such an extensive use of slate, but it was for the superintendent of um, the Slate Company. Um, uh, Bangor and Piscataqua Slate Company, and it was a demonstration house. It's kind of like the builder's spec house now that you go in and see. Look what you can use slate for. Fascinating. Wire Bridge, one of our great. Oh, North local. of Portland. Oh, yeah. New Portland. Yeah. Yeah, early, early suspension bridge. Yeah, been across that a yeah. few times. Katahdin and Iron Works. So these are some of these historic industrial sites that we we recognize. And the Tramway Historic District with up in, um, gosh, T8, R13, I think. This was a part of a, a, a railroad and conveyor set system that moved logs from Eagle Lake to Chamberlain Lake. Um, you know, it was put out of, this was put out of business by the Lombard uh, log hauler, um, but you can still find remnants of the railroad and the tramway up there. Yeah. So. Very, very interesting. Totally, you know, whatever you, you're looking for, you can find it. <laughs> oh, this is amazing. Yeah. Amazing. And we haven't found everything yet. <laughs> this is up in Dover Foxcroft. This is a grain store that we think is eligible for listing in the National Register that we might work on someday. And a mill in Milo that we found is eligible, we like. Do you have any old train stations? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, lots of train stations. Greenville yeah. Yeah. Junction Depot, where they're working on that building. Yeah. Recently listed in the register. Um, the Big Indian in Skowhegan is eligible for listing. So I'd love to see that happen. Oh, it's eligible, but isn't. Isn't. Isn't yet, but it could be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you had communications with the town on that? I don't know where that stands. I don't know if and we have recently, but you may be aware that it has been rehabbed the uh, yeah, last few years. Yeah, and, which is great. And they did a great Steve yeah. Dion and the crew did a great job with that. Yeah. So it's just amazing. So anyhow, that's a little little tour of some of the things that we have in the area that um, that we think are particularly special. That's absolutely fascinating. So it was nice to have some of the pictures of, of the actual projects that you've taken on and 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 the number of them i recognize because they're right <laughs> here in the in the somerset area as well as piscataqua yeah. so that was just just excellent uh well i think you know we've covered a lot of material here on the, have. on the show so this is just to make any closing thoughts uh christy i i, I want to put in a, a quick plug for the main bicentennial coming up our office is going to be looking at probably two or three projects to support that. Um, one of which is we're trying to identify 
every building that's in the National Register that existed in 1820 when Maine became a state. And we're also looking to uh, start identifying those buildings that existed where people may have voted for statehood or where the oh. proclamation of statehood was read. So look for more information look from up our Jameson office. Jameson Tavern in in, uh, in Freeport. In Freeport. That's not in the historic district. Yep. Yep. So things like that, town ha town halls, town offices, um, the steps of the the meeting house where somebody may have sat and the vote was. Yeah. Yep. We want to we want to recognize those places where people voted and where the news was. Uh, was was shared so that's something with to look forward to in the next couple of years yes i've gotten that bicentennials in in two years two years well coming right up well this has been an absolutely fascinating show christy and i'm not surprised at that at all giving the the speaker and the topic well i'm sorry katie wasn't here yeah to, to but i will guarantee in. you that katie will be watching this show and it will certainly meet her stamp of approval so we miss having katie here but get well soon Katie, yes. but we had uh, Christy Mitchell this morning from Maine Historic Preservation, an absolutely fascinating show, and thank you very much, and now you know. Thank you, Chris.